first husbands from the book of Exodus. Now the new king rules over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us shrewdly deal with them, or they will increase, and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us, and escape from the land. Therefore, they are task masters over them to oppress them with more slavery. They built supply cities, put them in premises for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in order and order and in every kind of field, of, in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of, king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of them was named Shepha and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the verse stool, if it is a boy, kill him, but if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned them some of the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allow the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they're vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all of his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him, in the, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a pious basket for him and plastered it with idiom and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His, his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe in the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the king's children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a message from the Hebrew woman to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew up, she brought him, brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses. Because she said, I drew him out of the water. The word of the Lord. The second lesson is from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with somber, sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually, we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministry. The teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. The word of the Lord. As you're able, I invite you to stand with me. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? 
And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And Jesus said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered, And blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he certainly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone what, that he was the Messiah. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. God uses you to make a difference in the world. In small ways and in large ways, God uses you to make a difference. There were two women once who made a decision. They took a chance and they changed the world. Their actions were at the same time really a small gesture, but also incredibly heroic. Because of their act of disobedience, God was able to rescue Israel from oppression. And their names are Shipra and Pua. And while some of you may know them, I'm betting that many of you have never heard of these two women before, which is a shame, because they have something to teach us all. That God calls us to make a difference in the world. What you do today, what you do tomorrow, what you do in the rest of this week could change the world. The beginning of Exodus really starts on a chilling note. A ruler, wishing to solidify his political base, identifies a common enemy, a scapegoat, to blame for whatever current problems the Egyptians were undergoing at that time. And you know, we've seen this movie before. We've watched this movie before in the 30s, especially, though not exclusively, in Germany, it was the Jews. More recently, it's been the illegal immigrants, or the welfare moms, or the undeserving poor, or the Muslims. I think that one of the chief manifestations of our sin is our fondness in defining ourselves over and against others. And then in that process, pointing others out as being the reason for all of the problems that we are experiencing now as a society. Well, in the Bible, it's the Israelites. In the Bible, it's the Hebrew people. They get pointed out by Pharaoh, who has conveniently forgotten that for generations, the Israelites who really, who he names as terrorists, they have been always considered as allies and friends of the Egyptians. They have been considered their guests, the Egyptians' guests, their honored guests in the Bible. But this Pharaoh, in fear of the Hebrews, points them out and marks them as the reason for all of Egypt's problems. And so he first enslaves them, and then he turns to even darker means. He tells the Hebrew midwives, Shipra and Pua, to kill all the Hebrew baby boys that are delivered. This Pharaoh is in fear of these 
Hebrew boys or Hebrew men, when in all actuality, Pharaoh should be in fear of these two women, Shipra and Pua. So Pharaoh orders that all the male babies be killed, and Shipra and Pua, they just cannot do it. And Pharaoh notices, he can't help but notice, that there seems to be still a lot of male Hebrew boys that are living, that they're out playing in the front yard. And so he calls Shephra and Pua on the carpet, and he asks them, why have you done this? Why have you allowed these boys to live when I gave you explicit instructions to kill all the baby boys upon their birth. And so Shepherd and Pua, being decent, upstanding citizens, they say to Pharaoh, well, I fear God more than I fear you. And so we refuse to kill male babies. Well, I think that's not how it goes. Shepherd and Pua, they never said this to the Pharaoh. In fact, they lied to the Pharaoh in response to Pharaoh questioning them about the boys living, the Hebrew boys surviving this birth process. Shifra and Pua, they say to Pharaoh, well, you know, the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They are so much more strong than Egyptian women. And before we can even arrive at the scene, the birthing scene, they've already given birth to the baby boys so that there is nothing that we can do. Well, they lie to Pharaoh. That's not true at all. How does God deal with Shifra and Pua for lying? Well, the text says that God dealt with the midwives because the midwives fear God. God gave the midwives families. Now that's interesting, if you know this one thing. Many scholars say that midwives in Israel were always barren women. They could not have children of their own. In a society where family was valued above all else, these women who could not have families of their own were given the responsibility of helping other women bring life into the world. So when God gave the midwives families, that's saying something. God just then pat Shifra and Pua on the back and say, good job for saving all the Hebrew boys. What God did is God blessed these midwives who once were barren. God blessed these midwives and allowed them to bear children and to be part of that important piece of society. God gave them the blessing of having children of their own when they lie. Now, I'm not saying that it's okay to lie. I don't want you to get that out of my sermon at all. It's not okay to lie. Lying will get you into more trouble than telling the truth. Right? But in some very, very special cases. Well, let's just say that people always come first. Let's say that when it comes to a matter of life or death, life always comes first. So these two lowly midwives, Shifra and Pua, they stood up to a mighty king. They lied and they won. And they changed history. For one of the boys that is spared will be called Moses, and he will lead the Israelites out of Egyptian captivity. He will deliver God's law to the Israelites. He will deliver God's law to all of us. And he will bring the Israelites to the promised land. And he will bring us to the promised land as well. And it all starts here. In today's text, with Shifra and Pua, these two women who were willing to say no to an act of injustice, 
I doubt very much that they thought that they were changing the world. But they were. They were making a difference. They were changing the world. They were changing the world just by being faithful, by following the directives of their hearts, by listening to the call of their own conscience. They changed the world. And I think this story reinforces for us how interconnected our actions are, how interconnected your actions are, what you do each and every day, creating an unforeseen effect that can ripple across time and space to affect the lives of millions. Who knows? Maybe one of you will offer some encouragement to a student who will see something in herself that she hadn't seen and turn to befriend another student who was on the verge of maybe giving up on life altogether. Or maybe one of you who is young, maybe that you will give a helping hand to an elderly man or an elderly woman who is in need of some help and assistance, a man and a woman who have become frustrated with all of their inabilities. But because you stopped and helped that person, you gave that elderly hope, and you brought that elderly person love and encouragement. Or maybe one of you will stand up to a neighborhood bully this week, and not only help uh, those kids for whom the bully has been bullying, but maybe you will help the bully him or herself, because nobody has ever stood up to that bully before in love and compassion. But you chose to do a small thing, to stand up to that bully, and because of that, you changed him or her to become more responsive to other people's needs. Not just to pick fun at those who are vulnerable in this world, but actually to help those who are vulnerable in this world. Or maybe one of you will be moved to volunteer in school this year and help a child to read and, and they will discover in that small act a love for language and they will turn out someday to be a great writer. Who knows what might happen because of what you choose to do each and every day of your life to make a difference. The things we do this week, our actions, our decisions, our choices, will in fact ripple out the consequences foreseen or unforeseen, for good or for ill, for the health or for the damage of the world. That question isn't whether, but the question is what. The question is what. What will you do this week to make a difference in the world? Some of these actions may be big, bold, and courageous. Others may be small, hardly noticeable. And yet they all have the potential to ripple out and affecting countless lives. You see, God uses you for this. God has gifted you for this very thing. Jesus says in the Gospel this morning that whatever is bound on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever is loose on earth will be loose in heaven. There is a power in faith, you see. There is a power on this earth that resonates into the highest of heavens. In every thoughtful gesture, in every supportive word that you offer, in every meal cooked, in the everydays of your work, in the capture a glimpse of what Jesus is promising here in this text. In the day of the Bible, God used Shifra and Pua to quietly stand up to a bully and a tyrant. But today and tomorrow, and the next day, God will use you. Amen. Let's stand together.